Um, well, thank you for inviting me to join your class. Um, I did tell you just a little bit ago that I had the pleasure of being in Kazakhstan and working with UN Women there, um, working with your um, National Evaluation Association and Program Evaluation and uh, the issues that we were working on particularly were related to uh, violence against women and um, prevention strategies and treatment strategies. And also we were looking at um, increasing the strength of the infrastructure of evaluation in your country. And um, we had people from your uh, parliament, is that the right word for your governing structure? Yeah, yeah. Um, we had the policymakers in the room with us to try to figure out how we could be a part of, or how, not myself, because I was there to just stimulate thinking and encourage people to, to uh, consider a framework for the work they were doing that would have implications for social action and for the improvement of conditions for people who are marginalized in society. And uh, in looking at the, um, the conditions in Kazakhstan and your history and the context and your governing structure, you've been through um, some very challenging times. And um, it's, it's a situation where it takes everyone committed to goals of justice and equity um, to bring about social change. And so that was what brought me to Kazakhstan. And I was very, very impressed with the people that I worked there with there. So um, I just share that with you as my knowledge about Kazakhstan is not extensive. Uh, you all are the experts in that because you've lived there, you, you've grown up there, <clears throat> you study there. And so um, as a part of the approach to research that I've been working on and developing with a variety of communities and in a lot of different countries, the first thing that I want to acknowledge is my humility of lack of knowledge about the context and the experiences of people in a place that I don't live and haven't grown up in and how we need to look at that knowledge as something that's incredibly valuable. Um, it can't come from an external expert. And so um, me being here with you is uh, a willingness to share in the things that I have learned in working in the field. Uh, I, I'm gonna say for almost 40 years now, um, I've been working uh, to try to figure out how do we do research that is appropriately inclusive of people whose voices have not been included in the meaning of what it means to do good research or in the understanding of the issues that need to be researched or in the use of the results of our research. And so um, my goal is to figure out those strategies uh, for appropriate inclusion of the full range of people who are impacted by, um, by the research that we do. Um, I have to apologize, we have some construction workers in the house today. There's nothing that I can do, so if you hear some noises, uh, they're just, they're, they're doing their work. <laughs> um, and so um, the framing for research that, that has evolved um, through all of my interactions with people in these different countries, in these different contexts, um, I came to call transformative research. Um, and to me, transformative has, um, in, the, in the choice of the name for that, <laughs> because what we want to come from our research is transformation. And so it's an action-oriented 
approach to research. This says, what is it going to take within this particular context to produce a research study that's going to have results that people who have the ability to create change will see it as valid and will want to use the results of that research to create better conditions. So whether you're talking about higher education or um, the elementary, secondary education, whether you're talking about formal education or um, you know, sports education, whatever level of education and type of education that you're talking about, who needs to be included in the process of determining what's the nature of the problem that needs to be investigated? You know, we think we know what it is, maybe because we read a lot of literature, and maybe we've had some personal experiences ourselves, but are there others out there who need to be brought into the conversation at a very early stage of the research to help us bring clarity to our understanding of what it is we think we're going to research? And so for me, I, I look at research as a process of building relationships. Who needs to be included? How do they need to be included? At what stage of the research should they be included? What are the power differences within the various constituencies so that we can address those right up front and say, look, you know, we don't want just the powerful people saying, this is the problem. This is what needs to be done. Um, I'll give you a, a real simple example. Um, in the United States, the, um, there is a problem with obesity. And so the, our federal government said, well, we're going to give money to some different schools to say, you know, do something to reduce this problem. And so a school got some money to do a, um, an obesity reduction pro project. And um, a friend of mine, Katrina Bledsoe, went to the school because they hired her to do the research about the effectiveness of what they were proposing to do. And she said, well, talk to me about how you understand the problem and what, what needs to be done. And the only people in the room were the people in power in the school. So maybe teachers, administrators. And they said, well, the problem is that the, the students have poor self-concept. And so um, that leads them to eat too much or to eat the wrong foods. And so what we need to do is make them feel better about themselves. And so my uh, Dr. Bledsoe said, well, do you, do you have data to support that framing of the problem? And they, of course, did not. They said, well, we just know it. And she said, well, you know, before we move forward with an intervention, maybe we spend a little bit of time figuring out the nature of the problem from the perspective of the people that you perceive as having a problem. And they were like, well, okay, you know, because otherwise we might do something it might not really be something that's appropriate. So, okay, go ahead. So she started um, collecting data. And one of the things she figured out very quickly was that in working with uh, students, let's say age 15 to 19 years, um, that maybe she as an adult uh, professor was not the perfect person for all the data collection. So she started training some of the students in how to conduct fo focus groups, how to do uh, the GIS mapping of their community so that the students could go out and say, look, this is what's in our community. One of the issues that came from that, and I would call, you know, the first stage was building those relationships and learning how to work together. The next stage was what I would call contextual analysis or needs assessment. And in that phase, what came to the surface was first in giving them um, 
well, in the focus groups, there was discussion around what does it mean to have more weight on your body than doctors recommend? So not labeling it as obesity, but just saying, you know, there are doctor's recommendations about how much weight you should have. So what does it mean? How do you perceive that? And many of these students were, uh, were African immigrants, um, some from uh, the Caribbean region. And, and many of them said, you know, being big, it's not it's not a bad thing people who are big sometimes that's important because if you're if you're very skinny and you have a famine those people die first so the perception of being big they didn't say oh gosh i feel so terrible about myself because i'm big they didn't so it's like negating the initial understanding of the nature of the problem and then understanding it better because you've talked to people in a respectful way to find out how they perceive that. And so then the question became, well, what is it about carrying extra weight that is of concern? And the students said, well, you know, we have aunts and uncles and parents who suffer from diabetes, who have heart problems, and we don't want that. So you see how the framing of understanding just what the issue is shifts when you bring in voices that hadn't been there initially to, no, it's not a self-concept problem, but we do have concerns about it. We have concerns about diabetes and heart disease. And then by <coughs> having them actually go out and map their communities about where can you get uh, healthy food, what are the food outlets? What are the various stores and so forth that are near the school in the community? What they see is liquor stores and fast food stores. So alcohol and unhealthy food and things like McDonald's, you know, fast food places that don't sell healthy food. So what is the nature of the problem? <laughs> the nature of the problem is shifting not from blaming somebody who's, you know, obese, but just saying, hey, there are other issues that are going on here. And in the broader community, they don't have access to healthy food. What about exercise? Can they go out and, and run? Can they do jogging? Can they do walking? And the students are like, um, you know, maybe you haven't been out on the streets here, but it's not safe. It's not safe. So your idea that like we should all go out for a walk or we should go for a jog, no, that doesn't work here. Going to um, a health club, you know, to exercise, completely out of the question. They're not located there, but even if they were, it's a poor community and they don't have the money to pay to go to something like that. So now we start to come to a better understanding of the nature of the problem that it's concern about heart disease and diabetes. There's lack of access to healthy foods. There's lack of access to opportunities for exercise. So now the intervention <laughs> needs to change from making them feel better about themselves <laughs> to how do we encourage conditions that address the diabetes and heart disease concern? How do we change conditions around the school to provide more access to healthy food? How do we change conditions so that there's an opportunity for exercise that's safe and something that those students want to engage in? And so from that then, the intervention became multiple, but it was all done through this research process of collection of data, what's necessary, who needs to be engaged, and so they moved to the next stage of having an intervention where they collected data and they said, all right, so for one thing, <coughs> we should do education about how to cook foods that these people in this community really enjoy, 
but do so in a healthier manner. So by having opportunities for them to see, you can still eat the food you enjoy, but there's, you have options in how they're prepared and there's ways to do it in a healthier manner. So they did some of that in the school with classes like that, but then they said, look, you know, the kids, these kids, they don't go home and go, I'm in charge of all the making of the food. If you don't bring the families into it, it's not gonna change. So they started having food fairs in the community, like on a Saturday, they would have a dietitian come in and show how to cook these foods in a healthy way so that all the families could come and they could learn and they could eat the food and they could learn together that this is a better way to keep yourself healthy. Another intervention that they did was that the students then went out into the community and collected petitions to take to their local government to have a grocery store brought into their community. So they were taking political action by asking their local government, find a store and present them with an opportunity through support, through provision of land, whatever it takes, so that we can get access to healthy food. And then the third thing was the students said, yeah, you know, we don't, we don't really, we can't go out to do the exercise, but we like to dance. And so the idea came up, why don't we give each student a pedometer, not a fancy, uh, what do you call those things now, you know, Fitbits. And you need something real expensive like that, just a little pedometer that would count your steps and they started having dance contests during lunchtime at school, right after school. And the winners, of course, were, were scored, yes, on style, but also on the number of steps they took. So here you have people doing something they really enjoy, getting exercise in a safe environment. So, you know, all of those interventions came because of the appropriate engagement of people who experienced the issue and understanding it first from their perspective. So when we talk about doing mixed methods, that's exactly what was going on here, was building relationships, who do you engage with, how do you engage, setting up ways to work together. That's a qualitative process going out into the community, counting the number of stores that sell fast foods, liquor, unhealthy foods, healthy foods, zero. That's quantitative. Doing focus groups with the students, qualitative. Then moving to the intervention and that at that point then, trust had been built up with these students. And this is a big deal, uh, particularly in the United States. The uh, people of color in the United States have been treated very badly in our health system, very, very badly throughout history. And so uh, they, they usually are not very cooperative. When you say, hey, I, I, you know, I'd like to do some medical tests, like blood tests and so forth, and they're like, uh, you know, you guys did that before on black people and they died, so no. But these people had built that trust through this process, so they agreed to like have their weight taken and have blood tests done so that they could have the measurements that would tell them about their propensity for diabetes or, or their propensity for heart disease. And so they had that kind of quantitative data as well and then continuing to collect the qualitative data. How's this going? What's working? What's not working? How do we modify things? And so you see a research process that has multiple stages that addresses issues of relevance to the population that's action-oriented. So for me, that's like a really great example of a transformative approach. And I, um, I have framed my work um, 
as a paradigm, as something that fits within the structure, the philosophical structure of research. Because um, when I was a graduate student, like, you know, 100 years ago, um, I, I was taught that you just collect numbers, that you do it experiments that you have random assignment and that's what makes good research I don't totally reject that I think you still can do experiments you still can collect numbers but I want to put it in that broader context of having appropriate engagement understanding the nature of the problem being responsive to the culture and the power issues in the communities in which we work. And then if an experiment and quantitative data is appropriate, then go that route, use that. Um, once I started working in the field and I was working in um, high poverty areas in the United States initially, I found that all those numbers weren't really giving me the understanding of, uh, that I needed of their context. What goes on here? What's their, what's their lives like? What, how do we be responsive to the pressures that they have in their lives? And so that's when I really developed my skills in qualitative methods to bring in that broader picture to understand better how people were responding to the types of interventions that we, that we thought might be good for them, what needed to be modified, we could follow the chain <coughs> of change <laughs> by collection of data all the way along. And that required us to use both quantitative and qualitative data. And so I really, uh, like many researchers, I think, came to mixed methods on a, in an intuitive way, that it made sense. We were dealing in complex contexts. And there were a lot of things we had to try to understand. And by having both quantitative and qualitative data, we could get a better level of understanding and be able to document how does change occur? What's needed for change to occur? And so um, when uh, some people uh, started saying, well, you know, maybe, maybe mixed methods, uh, we should. Um, we should have people get together who think that's important and let's find a way to do that. And so we started having meetings and it really was just it started almost informally of, of saying, well, some people say you can't mix methods because you have to be either a post-positivist with numbers or a constructivist with words. You can't be both. And then a bunch of us were saying, Oh, anyway, I was telling you about the genesis of, of a group getting together to talk about mixed methods. And we were like, well, what's the harm in just getting together and talking about it and figuring out what does it mean? And from that, um, after several years of, of meetings, but without having an organization that was saying we're mixed methods, we, um, we actually did found an organization called the... Mixed Methods International Research Association. Mixed Methods International Research Association. And it is international. Uh, one year we have the meeting somewhere in the world. The people, you know, they bid to have the meeting. This year it'll be in Vienna, Austria. And then the next year we have regional conferences. Um, and those are set up by people within various regions of the world. And so, um, they're smaller scale, um, and so they, they, we've had them in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Australia, in the United States, of course. I'm not sure we've had them in Asia yet, so that might be something people who are excited about mixed methods. Go to the MMIRA website and check it out, and um, you'll see a lot of people are interested in mixed methods and um you know a regional conference is not out of the question <laughs> okay and, and then just to to kind of wind up and see what kind of questions you might have 
Um, I was the editor for the Journal of Mixed Methods Research for five years. And that journal started because of this informal group getting together and saying, well, let's start looking at how people are using mixed methods. <coughs> what does it add to our understanding of the um, meaning of doing research? Can we address more complex issues? If we're, if we're collecting both quantitative and qualitative data, will we ask different kinds of research questions? Will we be engaging with different kind of research teams? So having, um, you know, people who are very strong in one method or another working together, what does that mean? How do you work out the strategies for working cooperatively in a productive way? And so those are the kinds of issues that were being addressed in the journal with um, examples of mixed method studies, but also, um, Focusing on the methodology and what we can come to understand better through the combination of quantitative and qualitative data collection, either in a single study or in studies that are sequenced. So starting maybe with qualitative, moving to quantitative, starting with qualitative, having both quant and qual data collected at the same time in the next stage. So. We can talk about um, sequential mixed methods. We can talk about concurrent six mixed methods where we have quant and qual at the same time. We can talk about cyclical mixed methods, which is the example that I shared with you about obesity is really a cyclical mixed method study. And I would argue is a transformative mixed method study because the goal at each level was to identify the meaning from the perspective of the people who are in that context to ensure that we're appropriately inclusive, that we're culturally responsive, that we're not making assumptions about how that phenomenon under study is being experienced by the people who are living it. If students are having trouble in school, what's going on there? Um, I was working in Nepal, and, um, and they uh, outlined a transformative mixed method study to explore the experiences of children who were internally displaced, who had left their communities um, because of violence and ended up living on the riverbanks in Kathmandu. And what was the educational experience for those children? and realizing that you had to bring their families into it. And you had to bring what, what constitutes social service agencies into it. That it's not a matter of saying, I'm going to help this individual student, but it's a cultural context, a moment of time in history that's impacted by what brought those people there and the conditions they're living in now. And so this transformative mixed methods um, is something that I see as a very dynamic and evolving <coughs> approach to research. Um, when I go to countries, I only go if they invite me. I go because people say we have issues around human rights. We have issues around social justice. And we want to try to figure out how to do research better in our own country. And, um, and so that, those are the people that I work with. So I just, I finished um, uh, a visiting professorship in Australia and Indonesia, uh, working with them with people who um, had been working in the rural areas and then uh, palm oil companies came and offered these people money for their land, which they went, hey, you know, I've never had real money, so that would be cool. Oh, okay. So they take the money and they go to the city and they find out that, that it's not like the best decision they ever made. Um, there's a lot of problems because there's not employment for everybody in the city. And if there is employment, sometimes it's not of the legal variety. 
And so there's issues around the adults and the children, the youth um, being alienated, not getting appropriate education. And so they're like, well, how do we address this issue? And so they are designing a study that is working with farmers um, in the rural areas to expand the kind of products that they're producing, expand their knowledge of marketing, so that if they do produce, if, if this particular area is big on coffee and strawberries. And so they're like, okay, and dairies. So they're like, well, we do milk, but we just sell it in the local community. We do strawberries. They don't travel. They don't last a long time. So unless we figure out something better to do, they're just going to be sold locally. So you see, they were seeing the constraints of the context they were living in. And so the idea was, well, let's, let's talk to the farmers. Let's find out, are there ways for them to take the crops that they're good at, that their land is good at, and say, how can we increase your production? And what happens with your produce or with your milk or with the dairy products so that it becomes something that is marketable and that increases their need for more people to work. And then you can keep your young people in the local communities and you're keeping the land in agricultural production because palm oil, frankly, destroys the land and it contributes to pollution and climate change problems because of the erosion and, and lack of coverage on the ground. So they're looking not just at social justice, but at economic justice and environmental justice. And saying, how do we do something that's appropriate in our own communities? So they ended up working with a coalition of farmers, the farmers' wives, and a group of young people trying to figure out what needs to be addressed here. How do you understand this? What do you see as potential solutions here? What kind of data needs to be collected? How should we collect that? Who should we share it with? Because what they told me was, you know, we get help from the government, but they send us somebody who says, you guys should make strawberry wine. Well, this is like a primarily Muslim country. And, you know, alcohol consumption is not high on their list. And just to be frank, I actually don't drink alcohol myself. But the idea of strawberry wine is like, ugh. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they said, you know, we knew, we knew that wasn't a good idea. But the government, for some reason, comes down and tells us this is what we should be doing. So how do we form ourselves into a coalition? And this became part of the research process of building capacity to build themselves into a coalition that would be strong enough to talk to that government agency and say, these are the kinds of things we need. If you could help us figure out how to, how to make yogurt, how to market yogurt and butter, things that are more transportable than milk, if you could help us learn even how to, we know how to make strawberry jam, but how do we make it in a way that it can be exported? That part of the puzzle was missing. And so they're coming up with very clear parameters of what they think will be useful for them. And this is all part of this transformative mixed methods cyclical approach of who needs to be engaged? What do we understand about the problem? What are the different perspectives of the problem? What makes sense in terms of interventions? How do we bring those interventions about? What's necessary? Those dynamics. Because too often, we see interventions introduced as a part of a research study, and then the time is up. And guess what happens? The intervention goes away. 
you know, but the problem is still there. So it's looking for data to support action that's culturally responsive, contextually appropriate, and has sustainability. So that's what I've been working on. That's what I've dedicated my life to. So I would be curious to know what kind of questions you would have that I might be able to address. Great. Oh, thank you so much. I'm going to try to manage some of the, the people that aren't right here with us. So if other people have questions, let me see if there's a way. I think that you can, you can kind of raise your hand if you're muted. You're not here, but also if there's, we've created, I think I sent you one set, one list of uh, questions in general. Um, oh, you did. <laughs> I haven't seen them. <laughs> they're kind of, they're kind of uh, specific, more specific to the articles. I'm going to pull them uh -huh. up across on my phone. But uh, okay, yeah. one thing that would be useful to hear, so this, <coughs> the, the MSc in Educational Leadership is a fairly condensed course, right? So everyone or most people are working full time or taking care of families or a combination of both. And the students then come onto campus about four times a year to take these couple of courses very intensively. So all day, most of us have been here all day. Uh, so it's right, so now quarter of eight and we've been here since about 9.30 in the morning. And, oh my. <laughs> right, right. So a long day, right? Amazing. And, and so then the research is also expected to be done in a fairly short amount of time. And we've uh -huh. seen even in the graduate school that more and more people are, more students are interested in mixed methods. And the question though is how could, how can you do especially transformative mixed methods in a short amount of time? And whether then in this case you would advise to narrow the topic, right? And just do one type of, one level of cyclical or do some other version of it or potentially not even do mixed methods. And you say, maybe it's actually better just focus on one and then in the future, use the next and then use the next. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I, I would love to hear what you think about that. Okay, well, let me uh, just begin by saying that um, when I'm asked to do a research study, no one has ever told me, Donnie can take as long as you want and we'll keep paying you forever. Never, ever have I heard that. There is always a limit, always. And you know, I know I shocked my students once by saying that I only do work I get paid for. It's not completely true. Occasionally I'll do something, you know, just because I really, really want to do it. But if, if they say this has to be done in two months, then I say, let me think how that can be done in two months so that it can follow the principles of transformative research because I believe that we have values that drive our decisions and that we don't change those values when we enter the research context and we don't change them based on the research question. <laughs> we don't change them <clears throat> based on the research topic. If someone asks me to do work, I come as who I am with the values that I have. And that influences my decisions and my values that I put the highest priority on are social justice and human rights. So it doesn't matter if you tell me we have one week, we have two months, we have a half a year, we have three years, those values are still gonna drive the decisions. Do we have to use mixed methods in every study? Certainly not. You do not have to. Um, each methodological decision should be made based on what is it that you're studying, what makes sense here, what is needed, in order to come to a better understanding of ways that we can contribute to transformation. So let me just give you an example of basically a two month study. Um, my university that I was at, I've retired from it now, Gallaudet University in Washington DC is a university for deaf people. So we 
Our primary audience are people who can't hear. We teach using sign language. Um, so that's where I taught for over 30 years. And they had a grant from the federal government to train teachers of the deaf um, to teach children who are deaf and had an additional disability. So children who are deaf and have cerebral palsy, children who are deaf and have learning disabilities, so on and so forth. A challenge when you have multiple disabilities. They had it for five years. The grant was ending. The um, principal investigator had actually taken another job in the university knowing that the grant was ending. So he called me and he said, Donna, we need to do a summative evaluation, the requirement for the grant. And so do you have a survey we can use? And I said, no, but if you want to come and talk with me about what's possible, I'm willing to talk with you. And so when he came to my office, I said, just, I want to start out by just asking you one question. Do you think that we have trained sufficient teachers for this population so that their needs will be met forever after, for next year, the year after that, five years from now? And of course he has to say no, because they've trained 40 teachers in the United States, a big country. So I said, well, would you like me to design a study that has the potential, hi baby, hi baby, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that has the potential to continue to address the needs of those teachers and those students? Is, would you like me to try to do something like that? And he's like, well, how much is it gonna cost? <laughs> Of course, how much is it going to cost? And I said, you know, whatever your budget is for the summative evaluation, we'll do it within those constraints. And it wasn't very much money. So I, um, I talked to my graduate students, and I found three who were interested in working with me, two who what I would describe as culturally deaf. They were born deaf. They grew up in deaf families. They used sign language through their whole lives. One who was born hearing, lost her hearing, now uses a cochlear implant. So when she has the cochlear implant in, she can use the phone and she can talk, but she also knows sign language. So we had a team of two culturally deaf, <laughs> one deaf person who uses assistive of listening and myself as a hearing person. So for me, the, the composition of that team was important because we reflected the people who were in the teacher training program. They had hearing people, they had assisted listening people, they had culturally deaf people. And so we wanted to reflect that part of the population or the, the people, the participants in the program so that we could communicate appropriately. Then we did a document review. We read the first request for proposal that Galdet had responded to. We read the proposal where Galdet said what they were going to do. We read their five years of annual reports. We looked at the curriculum materials that had been developed for the program. And we said, look, they're gonna have a reflective seminar for their graduates coming up real soon where they're inviting their graduates to come back and reflect on their experiences. So we went to the principal investigator and said, can we come to that and observe? And can we have some of the time to interview the people who are there? And he, you know, like I said, he has another job already. So he's like, shoot, you know, you guys want to come and take over part of the time. I don't have to do as much work. So yeah, okay. So we went and we observed. And then the team would meet each day and look at our observations and say, these are the issues we see coming up. So then when we did the interviews, we were able to use our observational data and say, we observed this. Can you tell us more about that? Like you have talked about the problem of behavioral problems in the classroom. 
And so can you talk to us about how you experienced that? You have talked about feeling excluded from your school. We want to have a better understanding of what that means. And so we had students, or now their teachers, tell us, well, you know, when I went into my school, the principal told me, you don't need to do lesson plans for those kids because I don't think you can teach them anything anyway. Yeah, what a horrible thing to say. Um, and so when I talked then, I did interviews with the professors from the university and the teachers who were in the schools where we placed our students. And I said, you know, th this is just something that came up from the data. And I'm curious about your reaction to that. You know, I didn't ask them quantitative scale numbers, like on a scale of one to five, how do you think your students were prepared to go into the schools? On a scale of one to five, would you say the program is effective or not? You know, I didn't do that. I said, these are some of the things that your students said. So I'm just curious about your reaction. And you could already start to see the transformative change. You could see the wheels in their head going around and they're going, wow, wow. We, we talk about high expectations. We talk about teachers having high expectations for their students, but we haven't talked about encountering low expectations from the people in power in the school. <coughs> And the skill to address that problem is completely different than the one of having high expectations for your own students. That's an advocacy skill. You have to be able to advocate for your students in that context, and we didn't teach them that. So they're already thinking, these are things we need to be addressing that we didn't do before. And then they were going, we really, we, ha we didn't really understand the kinds of issues they were encountering every day. We should have been there more for them. How can we do that? Huh, maybe we could have some online support for them. Maybe we could recruit experienced teachers who can agree to be online, you know, rotating on and off an hour or two a week to say, write in what you've experienced that's conflicting or frustrating or wonderful, and you'll get response right away from someone who's struggled with that. So we're seeing transformative change right there happening during the interviews, but we didn't leave it there. We knew that there was a professional association of professors who prepared teachers of the deaf. It was 72 universities in the United States and in Canada who had an annual meeting every year. So we took our data to the meeting and we did what's known as reader's theater. And we would read from the transcripts, problems like the one I just shared with you. And we'd stop and then we'd say, so what do you think? And by the end of that meeting, there were at least 60 people in the room which is huge because I told you there's only 72 universities and each one has like one faculty member. The people had organized themselves into virtual working groups to address aspects of this preparation of teachers. So they had a website that allowed them to have virtual working groups and they continued to work on the issue. So that was finished in two months from start to finish, from the day we sat down to collect data to the day we met with the larger group. And I would argue that it was the way it was framed. It was culturally responsive. It was bringing in the voices of those who are not traditionally heard. It was a collection of quantitative and qualitative data. It was done in a way that would satisfy the funding agency to have a summative evaluation done, but it was also done in a way to stimulate transformative change. So I think it's knowing who you need to include, how to include them, and doing that throughout the study. That's great. 
it's really it's wonderful to hear the process and to hear the exact examples, right? So even if they shift, right, with the particular study itself, that here's concrete ways in which it could take place. So, all right, who, who might have questions? Anyone here or anyone else at home, if you want to text in or raise your hand, I see right now, I can see Aigul Modir and Zuliad. If you make, if you raise your hand, I'll unmute you also. Or anyone here? Any questions? I think I see someone who wants to ask a question behind you. <laughs> She's getting her hand ready. <laughs> You're not sure. All right. Okay. 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 So I did not get your list of questions. I don't know where it ended up. So if there is something from the list, I think I need to go in about five minutes. So I think one more question is about what I can manage. All right, sounds great. I was gonna ask you if you had time. All right, so I'm looking for the questions now. Is there anything else that came up? All right, so the questions, or anything else for y'all? Okay, one more moment and almost there. Okay, I know, so one question was actually about the, about the trans, transformative framework, so about the article itself, in terms of how, I don't know if you want to try it, would you like to try it, to explain it? What am I? When I was reading the article about transformative message, mixed message, I came with the question about assumption. So, uh, okay, you froze. So is it possible for you to either repeat it or somebody share it with me? Uh, as I know, assumption is something that is believed but not proved. So uh, if it's an assumption, uh, could, I, could we conduct the research as a thesis paper? Or should we do policy analysis on assumption? Or should we uh, change assumptions or hypotheses in order to conduct the quantitative research? But mm. to do the qualitative one, can we um, make the assumption in qualitative topic or it's some kind of confu confusing for me? And also uh, eval about evaluators. The term evaluator, uh, should mm. we, um, call these people evaluators comment from the third parts or who are the evaluators or evaluators ah. researchers? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Evaluators um, are people who do the evaluation of programs and um, they use the methods of researchers, but they always put their work in the context of trying to determine what needs to be done, who needs to be involved, how is it being implemented, what is the effectiveness, how can it impact policy. So re some researchers conduct their research in that way. Evaluators always conduct their work that way. And so that's really the distinction is that evaluators get hired by people to do something very specific. And the goal is to figure out what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, how it is done, what the effects of that are, and then implications for change in policy. Um, the word assumptions may be um, confusing because it is used in a number of different ways. Um, in the articles, I'm using it as a way to clarify the assumptions that researchers make that inform their methodological decisions. So if you are working in a post-positivist paradigm, there's an assumption that in order to collect the best data, that you should be neutral, objective, 
distant from, not engaged with, right? That's the idea. Give me a survey. I'll send it out. I'll never see those people. So that, that means I'm collecting good data, okay? The constructivists say, well, how do you know how those people are interpreting those questions? How do you know you're even asking the right questions? And so they're making an assumption that in order to really understand something, you have to be engaged. You have to be interactive. You have to get close enough to understand what's going on. And so those are two assumptions. Is one right and one wrong? I'm not gonna, I, I don't think there's an answer to that. It's what you truly believe about the nature of reality, of epistemology, and those are your assumptions that guide you. The transformative assumption would say there probably are different versions of reality, but some of those versions of reality are gonna sustain oppression. And some of those versions of reality are gonna move us forward towards improved justice. So you take the version of reality, the reason the kids are obese is because they have poor self-concept. That's just gonna sustain oppression. Nothing's gonna change in that community because that's not a version of reality that's gonna to move towards justice. The version of reality that they don't have access to healthy food, places to exercise, that what they need is instruction on the prevention of heart disease and diabetes, that's gonna move you forward. So the assumption about the nature of reality, not something that I can prove, but it's an assumption that I truly believe and it influences my methodological decisions. Okay, all right. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, we have, I don't know if you have two more minutes, we have, uh, Aijan would like to ask a question if possible. Okay, let's hear this question, then I really have to go. Then absolutely. Okay. Let's see, we have uh, unmuted Aijan. <coughs> uh, okay, let's see if you're... Can you, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so what what can we do uh, in case of that when we collect the data from the qualitative or quantitative research in the mixed methods? Yes, when we use in research mixed methods, uh, and what what should we do if the data collected from these mixed me methods are different? Hmm. Okay, good question, good question, and it's not something to worry about because if you're getting different answers, different understandings from different data collection methods, then you put those in conversation with each other. And you say, what's going on here? How do I understand why I got this from this and that from that? Who do I need to bring into this conversation to help me understand this better? So if you got everything exactly the same, the same, the same, the same, the same, to report that and it's interesting if you get conflicts you pursue it further and it gives you opportunities to understand things in ways you simply would not have had you not gotten those conflicts so don't worry about it celebrate it use it to create better understandings that's thank you mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful way to end here Right. This is um, it's really it's really an amazing chance that we've had to, to speak with you. We this is it's been really amazing uh, to think about these different ways of uh, of doing research and to address issues of social justice, of transformative ways of being within within the communities. Because I think this is a key thing and one of the uh, the ways that the university here, or the main mission is that here we're developing leaders, they're going to do research and it's going to transform the country and the world. So. All right, well, I say yay, go for it. 
so happy to see are you people there uh, with this goal in your lives because that's what it's going to take. Thank you so much. You. Really okay. appreciate it. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.